Hello and welcome. My name is Johannes. I will be the host of this new show, Utopias, Dystopias and Today's Technology. And this particular episode will be special. Of course, as the show goes on, I am hoping that you will put in some and let me know and the direction can evolve naturally in some ways. So what is this show and why do I bring it and who am I? I'm, my name is Johannes, as I said. I, I originated from Europe, from the German Austrian area. I was born in Germany, but I spent my teenagehood in Vienna, Austria, from which I then went to Los Angeles when I was 19 years old. And that's kind of where the story really starts. So I will begin with a short introduction and broad strokes of my life from when I moved to Santa Monica uh, to the present time. So I, I was, as I said, living in a motorhome behind the Santa Monica Cemetery for the most part, but it was mobile. So I, I lived all over Los Angeles in, in that sense. And then I, I moved to New York to start my bachelor's um, or to finish my bachelor's, which I was a lot of, of the courses were accredited uh, at Santa Monica College. But um, I, I finished my bachelor's at, at, in New York City at Columbia University, where I majored in economics with a minor in cultural anthropology. I then worked for two years as a research assistant to macroeconomist Chris Foote at the Federal Reserve Bank in Boston. And, and, and that's a very interesting time because it was during the crisis at which, um, you know, it was an interesting time. It was a tragic time, you can say. It motivated me. Uh, it was it was certainly emotional. Uh, at the same time, it was fascinating because you could really see, well, when, when a system breaks, you can often see a lot about it. A lot, of, uh, a lot of the parts reveal themselves. Importantly, also during this time, I started. Uh, I studied um, at Harvard uh, as a special graduate student, where I took a particularly noteworthy course with Amartya Sen, who argues, among other things, in uh, in his capability approach to ethics, that public debate uh, around ethical issues is absolutely crucial to come to uh, to overcome certain impossibilities that are baked into, the, or that seemingly are baked into. Um, making decisions collectively and, uh, and basically having a representative approach to, to ethics. Uh, so for that, what is really important is to use public debate uh, to overcome superficial differences and to, to arrive in a world where, o where only those differences between cultural differences and, and ethical differences really uh, persist that are really based on on reasons that are defendable and and then I started uh, my master's in sustainable development at Columbia University again where I moved back to New York City I was there quite a bit of time I took a little bit longer uh, and I, I worked on some computational social science um, models as well as experiments in the in, in the Columbia University Social Science uh, Laboratory, where I ran some experiments having to do with the complexity of a system and the, um, the, the, the world views that emerge from that, or, or you know, these were quite, I mean, it's quite a restricted type of worldview, which is a causal one. So you observe some, some stochastic system of related variables, and you build a model in, in the experimental in, in, in this sort of experimental laboratory, everybody builds a, a model of the system that they observe, and then they get paid according to um, according to events from that system as they are drawn 
from that system and, and they get paid basically correlated with their beliefs, how accurate their beliefs are of the system. This was an interesting ex experiment where I found basically that the you know, diversity of opinions or belief systems uh, in this kind of situation persists much longer uh, persists much longer in more complex systems, unsurprisingly. But anyway, so in this process of of building these experiments, I wa uh, worked on an open source uh, software package. Um, that, that that was on Bayesian belief networks, which happened to have been developed by the then head of data science at eBay, who hired me at, at eBay, and I worked there for nearly three years um, as a as a data scientist. And then I moved to to London. Well, I, you know, I, I still uh, spent a lot of time in in the United States, but I I live currently in London, uh, where where I've been uh, active in data science and various uh, consultancies, advising uh, people on their uh, machine learning problems, um, companies, uh, small um, municipalities, government agencies, um, mostly companies, <laughs> but also hospital, uh, a hospital, and so on, um, on, on their machine learning strategies. Uh, and on their particular algorithms to solve various problems. And, the, and, and all this practice, for me, um, isn't complete unless I have a conversation that is global in, nat in nature about uh, technology, at least about machine learning and, and artificial intelligence, because that is where my practice is. But I, I, I want to make this conversation broader, so as to really touch all uh, areas of, of technology that is at the moment there are a lot of buzzwords floating around and people are not so sure what these things mean. Blockchain and crypto are concepts that are very correlated. We will try on this show to explain what these terms mean from various perspectives and I will have guests from all over the world. My first guest, Somil Gupta, will be calling in from so Sweden. Okay, so I'm, I'm basically, I live in Sweden and I am originally from India. I My second guest, Shamika Klassen, will be calling in from Colorado in the United States. My third guest, Ashish Kumar Singh, will call in from Dubai. My fourth guest, Amara Sese, will call in from Nigeria. I'm actually in Nigeria, but I, I was born in Sierra Leone. My fifth guest, Flavio Azevedo will be calling in from wherever he is on his digital nomad journey. A sixth guest, um, Olivia Gamblin, will be calling in from San Francisco, from the San Francisco Bay Area. I feel very strongly about the fact that the technologies that we build affect humans all over the planet, all over the world. And we often don't really understand their circumstances very well. Your assumption is that yeah. this uh, tech uh, is going to work perfectly because it is good. It is a good technology. You've tried it in yeah. the UK. It's fantastic. But now you're talking to somebody uh, in the heart of Africa. Is that going to be the same outcome? Humans are the only species that studies itself. And this started in the social sciences. And then now it has become a data science, which is part, part of a, um, a tech, the tech stack, if you will, now of most companies. And now we're studying ourselves in sometimes useful ways, in ways that will elevate ourselves if we understand ourselves better. The way that corporations study humans often is, um, is, is to take advantage of their weaknesses, to sell them more or to engage them more in some ways, which not always is beneficial to them. At times during this show, we will go quite deep uh, into, a into a historical depth. So uh, 200 years ago, when we were starting with Industrial Revolution, uh, I just came across one uh, newspaper article where people felt that they are being forced into employment. 
And we might be saying, sometimes we might be talking about things that some people don't want to hear. Africans were brought to the United States and enslaved. They were considered subhuman. They were we will talk about differences in culture. Parents have different reasons mm. for exposing their, their children to technology. And, and that's what makes it really, really complex. As well as some ways in which we are all the same. But the interesting thing for me is the virtues across different cultures, across different societies, we do see patterns in what kind of virtues are praised. For example, the virtue of being honest. We will be talking about the actual technologies that everyone is uh, has on their lips these days. We will discuss such things as the metaverse, the blockchain, AI, machine learning, that's why I normally I like the term distributed ledger technology because it can be like a kind of umbrella that packs all these concepts. Because like I said, the blockchain by itself is just a kind of database of transactions. So, you know, digital twin is a terminology which talks about that, okay, uh, you know, what you are in the real world can be replicated in the digital world. If you, uh, if you recall movies like Tron and, you know, other sci-fi. Brings us to the sharing economy. How can we use these assets more effectively within our economy so that none of us gets have unmet needs, but at the same time, we do not create wastage. We will talk about centralized and decentralized systems and the difference between them. So uh, first of all, we need to understand that why decentralization is important. So decentralization is as good as democracy. So what is democracy? Democracy for the people, by the people. So if that had to happen in technology, what was happening before is, like today, Google has your entire data. Facebook has your entire information. Yes, yes. But if you want to really, right, yeah. you know, segregate it and give control to the, you know, the, you can say the owner of the data, that makes it, makes it decentralized. And that was actually the essence of creating decentralized metaverse. But again, metaverse is just a front end. Some guests I will challenge by, for example, calling the metaverse a digital dollhouse. You know, the serious people are doing serious stuff in the metaverse. It may not become your de facto technology. It may not become part of your life as a major, as a major thing, but it will stay. It will, it's going to stay. It will stay there. So if you learn it, if you know about it, you might be able to contribute it in a in a better manner. See, my focus is always not on how it should be, but I just mm -hmm. try to look at what is available to me. Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't think ever, at least what I am aware of, or even in my lifetime, ever has been so much knowledge, resources, tools, mm -hmm. opportunities available to each and every one of us for practically free of cost. And we will talk about ethics. Techno-womanism is applying the womanist ethic to social justice issues that happen in and around the digital space and around technology. But you have to know as an individual going in, you have to know where your lines are that you are not going to cross. We will talk about what empowers people. So uh, why don't you teach them that there are technologies out there that put them in the driver's seats, give them the upper hand to use technology mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. very innovative ways. Of course, we are doing something, I mean, uh, uh, something in the healthcare industry. And that's, that's definitely revolutionary from our perspective. And we are doing it with the regulators here. You have to get the experts around the globe at real time you know, giving real time, you know, attention to how the surgery is happening or how the, you know, diagnosis is happening. And that becomes, you know, a very, very inefficient, uh, you know, uh, method if it is not happening in a real time basis with some immersive experience. A user experience researcher, I would want to bring in marginalized voices who are impacted by various digital products and bring them into the conversation from the inception of a technology all the way through to um, when it's released out into the market. So and we will talk about what disempowers people. Uh, but because of the nature yeah. of the economy and the fact that they have to juggle a lot of things uh, to make ends meet. So a lot of parents uh, would rather have a uh, to substitute that quality time they have with their children. From age two, they are exposing their children to technology. Because when the children are crying 
uh, throwing tantrums and they expose them to phone, I think there's something the screen does to, to their brain that makes them keep quiet or that makes them excited. So, so that's where I think the responsibility comes in, in, in our hands. I mean, people like us who have been, you know, working in this area for, for, you know, for so long should segregate what is required in metaverse and what is not required in metaverse. So again, metaverse is not a replacement of your real life experiences. But nobody uh, looked at it from a very, very holistic point of view. And that is why discussions like this are very, very important. Because now we, we are talking about schools, mm -hmm. education, educators and technology. But see uh, how the, convers the conversation moved into inequality and into standard of living. I want to also kind of appreciate this this initiative. I think it's a great initiative because uh, I think a lot of these things they don't get discussed. That's always there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also good that I'm I'm, I'm really kind of very uh, happy and uh, you know want to congratulate you because putting it this Thank this you. platform together and this initiative, I think it's it's a great. Uh, and we might have a lot of opinions, but at least <laughs> as long as we have a forum to share it, yes, you know, exactly. I think we will exactly. we are making progress. Because it is when people have this exposure that. They build uh, technology with more empathy and they build technology with a global outlook. This show will be published Wednesdays at 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time every week. Please come and join the conversation and start by subscribing to this show now. Since we are still waiting for Spotify approval, it will take about two weeks. Um, uh, don't expect a show next week and the coming week after that. Um, but expect one the weeks following, every single week. Um, we will begin with Somil Gupta's show, uh, and I will see you in about three weeks on Wednesday. Wednesday.